We're focus focusing on how to get our digital data uh, across a link still, and we introduced the concept of framing. Framing in the previous lecture where we said that we divide our data that we want to send into chunks, and we call those chunks frames. There are some other names we'll see that we'll come across, where the frame is contains some actual data, which we refer to as payload, but it also contains some other information that helps the communications work correctly. And some of those things that it may, the other information it may contain include the address of who's sending, who's supposed to receive, maybe a sequence number to count the frames, so that if we send a thousand frames, the receiver can check that it's received the correct a thousand frames in order, and some other information. And that extra information we contain inside either the header or the trailer, or both, where the header is broken into a set of fields, and each field has some values. The exact structure of a particular frame depends upon the, the standard. Wi-Fi for wireless LAN communications, say from your, your phone to an access point, uses one particular standard and defines one type of frame. Wired LAN uses something different. Your ADSL home connection uses something different again. So there are different frames for different technologies. But they all follow this general structure of having header, payload and trailer, although not all three are necessary. We'll see different examples. And then we started to look at different ways that we measure the performance of our communications, our, our link communications. We know data rate is one measurement. The data rate is depending upon the, the signaling technique that we use and how we transmit our data as, as signals. So we usually have some signal element or a signaling rate, and each signal element contains one or more bits, and from that we can determine the data rate. In practice, you can think data rate is part of a specification for equipment or a technology. You buy your laptop, inbuilt is a LAN card, and the standard defines that the data rate for that LAN card is either 10, 100, or 1,000 megabits per second. You as the end user cannot change that, that's built into the technology. You buy your new mobile phone, and the data rate for, for Wi-Fi says that you, the standard for Wi-Fi says the data rate goes up to, say, 300 megabits per second. Or with LTE as a, as a mobile phone, a data communication system goes up to, say, 40 megabits per second. That is usually defined based upon the technology, and it may vary. We'll spend some time talking about delay, the time it takes to get a message from one point to another. But we also mentioned error rate. That is, what percentage of things arrive in error or don't arrive. Things could be bits, frames, packets. So there may be different names, but some measurement of how many errors are there. Often that's a, a characteristic of the link or a, uh, sometimes even a specification of the link saying the maximum error rate for this link is, say, 1%. Sometimes we cannot control that. From the end user's perspective, if we're aware of the error rate, we can do something about it, but we may not be able to reduce it. We said in our frames we have header and trailer, so we can say that they're not the actual data, so we'll count them as overhead. Stuff that we must send, but don't carry our real data that we want to communicate to someone. So we count them as an overhead. And throughput will, instead of just using data rate to talk about speed, we'll use throughput to indicate the speed at which our real data gets delivered to the destination. So we need to take into account now overhead. And we may need to take into account errors. If we send data, it gets delivered, but there's an error, then it's not really the effective data delivery. So we wouldn't count that towards throughput. And some technologies 
have rules such that they cannot be transmitting all the time. They'll spend some time not transmitting, and that leads to uh, a calculation for the throughput. Efficiency is how well we use something, some utilization. So if I buy a link, and for my home ADSL, and I pay 500 baht per month for a 10 megabit per second download data rate, then I want to use that 10 megabits per second as much as possible. So efficiency is a measure of how much I use or utilize that, that link. So we talk about efficiency usually as some ratio between throughput and data rate. If I have a data rate of 54 megabits per second, but I achieve a throughput of just 20 megabits per second, the maximum I can get is 54, but I'm only getting 20, we can say we're 37% efficient in using that data rate. There's also some other uh, calculations of efficiency. Some of the main performance metrics we care about. We've seen a couple of examples. Let's look at delay in, in more detail, and we'll see some more examples as we go through delay. How long does it take to get a message from A to B? So let's look at the different components or the different things that may cause delay. First, recall our knowledge of signals. And a, a quick drawing of a, a signal, we we can draw our digital signal. One of the, the characteristics of our signal we said was a signal element. And another way we can look is how many signal elements per second, and we can talk about a signaling rate. And the bits per signal element combined with a signaling rate gives us our data rate. So that are some of the concepts we've seen before. Just a reminder. That is, <clears throat> with a signaling scheme, we will define the duration of signal elements. Let's say one millisecond. So we'd send one signal element every one millisecond. That would give us a signaling rate of 1,000 signal elements per second. So the rate's the inverse of the signal element duration. And the signaling scheme would define how many bits per element. The basic case we looked at was one bit per element, but we may have more. We could have two bits per element, or four bits per, three bits per element, and so on. We saw different schemes. If we know that, if we know we're sending signal elements at some rate and how many bits per element, then we can determine the data rate. The question with regards to delay is, how long does it take to send us a message of so many bits out of my computer. So let's put some numbers to those and let's say, just for simple calculations, the signal element duration is one millisecond. One millisecond per signal element, therefore a rate of 1,000 per second. Let's say we transmit two bits per element. We have a scheme such that every signal element can represent two bits. So we'd get a data rate of 2,000 bits per second. 1,000 elements per second, two bits per element, 2,000 bits per second. So if we have a data rate of 2,000 bits per second, we can think that when we transmit a signal from my computer to the destination computer, Every one millisecond, we're sending two bits out. Every one millisecond, we send a signal element, and then we send the next signal element, and so on. And it takes one millisecond per signal element. So we can use that to determine how much time it takes to send a certain number of bits. So if we have 
a frame frame size of say 10,000 bits we'll keep it simple in, in bits at this stage then we want to send this frame of 10,000 bits how long does it take to send? Well, we're sending 2,000 bits every second we have to send 10,000 bits therefore the the time it takes is 5 seconds and we'll call this the transmission delay we'll see the names on the slide so quite simply one component of delay is how long it takes to transmit that data that message or frame using our particular data rate for our, our technology 10,000 bits at 2,000 bits per second takes 5 seconds easy or you can look at the detail okay 1 millisecond per 1 signal element so how many signal elements are there? 5,000 signal elements 1 millisecond each takes 5 seconds Transmission delay is one aspect of how long it takes to get a message from one point to another. But there's more. This is the time to transmit the signal containing the data out of my computer. But then that signal propagates. it propagates across the link to the destination is received we transmit a signal it propagates if we think of a waveform it attenuates as it goes across some distance and then it's received the other component of delay is how long does it take each signal element or each bit to get to the other side to propagate from transmitter to receiver how do we determine that? How long does it take a signal to get from one point to another? Distance. It's going to depend upon the distance. How long does it take a, a signal to get from my laptop up to the access point on the wall? It depends upon the distance and the speed. Speed of what? not the data rate, the data rate is how many bits per second my laptop can transmit out but then if you look at every bit or every signal element representing each bit how long does that signal element take to propagate the wave propagate up to the access point so it depends upon the distance the speed of what? well the speed of the signal in propagation and there are different speeds that we'll talk about so a second component of delay we'll say is propagation what are we Let's see if I've missed something. Oh, I think we've got it. We're going through these delays in this uh, slide. Propagation delay. This depends upon how far our signal needs to propagate and how long it takes to propagate. And that depends upon the medium. Remember we have different types of media. We have wired and wireless with wired we talked about optical fiber coaxial cable twisted pair so electrical wires uh, glass and plastic fibers where light propagates through and with wireless we have radio waves that propagate through the air how fast do these signals travel what's the fastest speed that they can travel light speed 
Okay, so if we think of optical fiber, in the best case, light comes in at one endpoint and travels at the speed of light at, through to the other endpoint. How fast does electricity travel through copper conductor? It's not light, but it, the speed is close to the speed of light. Okay, it's maybe, it depends upon the materials. It may be 2 by 10 to the power of 8 or 2.5 by 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. But most signals propagate at a speed approaching the speed of light. And if I don't tell you otherwise, you can assume that our signals always propagate at the speed of light. And you remember the speed of light for the exam, which is what? 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. Remember that, that one. So the propagation delay depends upon the distance and the speed at which we send. So if we have a distance of our link of between the transmitter and receiver, and let's give it some numbers, Thirty kilometers. We have a long link, a long cable between our two points. And let's consider the speed of propagation, the speed of the signal. What propagation delay do we get? To send 30,000 meters, 30 kilometers, at 300 million meters per second, it takes 0 0.0001 seconds. We'll keep the unit in seconds. So there's two parts for getting our message from A to B. It's how fast can we transmit the bits out of our computer, out of the transmitter. And then if you think every bit propagates through the medium. And that takes some time as well. And we call that propagation delay, which depends upon the distance, and the speed of the signal, not the speed of our transmitter. This is not data rate. This is the speed of our signal, the physics of it. The total delay, we can think, is the summation of those two. One way to, to realize that it's the summation of those two is to visualize them. I'll show you what I'm trying to draw in a moment, or explain. Let's say we want to understand why the transmission delay and the propagation delay are additive in this case. If I see any homework from other courses or any phones or games for the rest of this semester, then you'll lose attempts on the quiz. one attempt instead of two, or zero attempts instead of two. If you want to do your homework for your other courses, then do it in another room, not in this one. So why, does the, why can we add the propagation and transmission delay? Let's, let's think of it in a simple perspective, the transmitter. What we'll try and draw is the bits being transmitted. Here's our transmitter. Think if we send a signal for each bit, and that takes some time. So we transmit bit one out of our computer. It takes some time to transmit. Then we transmit the next bit, 
we move on to the next bit immediately after the first bit. Then we transmit bit 3, bit 4, bit 5. In our case, we had 10,000 bits. We keep drawing. How long does it take to transmit the 10,000 bits? Will not be to scale. We had 10,000 bits in our frame. Well, we calculate that. We know that every bit at 2,000 bits per second, every bit takes half a millisecond. The number of milliseconds. This takes a half a millisecond to transmit. Another half. And we go, if we do that 10,000 times, the total time is 5 seconds. I see a few people leaving. They're going to do their homework. Good, that's fine. That means uh, the, the exam will be easy for them in this course. Each bit in our example takes half a millisecond. Why? Because we said 2,000 bits per second calculates if we do the inverse of 2,000 bits per second, we get half a millisecond. So transmit the first bit takes half a millisecond, then another half for the second, and we keep going after 10,000 bits, it would take us five seconds to transmit. This is the transmitter computer. Let's see what happens at the receiver. At the receiver, so this is the transmitter, then we propagate across some link and eventually receive those, the signal representing those bits. Focus on the first bit. It's transmitted at, let's say, at time zero. We start transmitting. We finish transmitting the first bit at time 0 0.5 milliseconds. When does the first bit arrive at the receiver? When is the first bit fully arrived at the receiver? If we, if we start our time, we start transmitting at time zero. Then at 0 0.5, we've sent the first bit. That's coming out of the computer. But we said the signal representing that bit must propagate through the link. How long does it take to propagate? Well, we calculated this 0 0.0001 seconds. 0.1 milliseconds. So if we transmit at time zero, if we count in milliseconds now, and finish transmitting at time 0.5, at what time is it received? 0 0.6. Why? We said the propagation delay is 0 0.001 seconds or 0 0.1 milliseconds. So here, just to keep the numbers, we're dealing with milliseconds. It takes 0 0.5 to transmit one bit, another 0 0.1 to get to the other side. At what time does the second bit get received? One point one. If we think of the time, it, we start at zero, plus point five, plus another one. A uh, point five gives us to one millisecond, plus the propagation delay, one point one milliseconds. It's received. So what's happening here is that while we're transmitting we're transmitting the next bit, the previous bit is propagating across the link. They're happening in parallel. So the second bit is being transmitted while the first bit is traveling across the link. Similar, the third bit is being transmitted, the second bit is traveling across the link. They happen in parallel. And if you follow that through, 
At what time is the entire 10,000 bits received? There's some delay to get there. The fifth bit. As you'll see, it's half a millisecond difference, so 1.6. because the transmission time is half a millisecond for each, plus the 0 0.1 for propagation, five seconds or uh, 5,000, maybe easier, 5,000 milliseconds, what time does the last bit arrive? Well, the 5,000 plus that 0 0.1 propagation delay. And if you don't believe me, go through and draw 10,000 bits and calculate those times. You'll see that. Well, the end result, what's the total time to get that message from transmitter all the way through to receiver? If we started at time zero, we've received it in its entirety at time 5,000.1 milliseconds which is just the summation of the transmission and propagation delay. 5,000 milliseconds plus the 0 0.1 milliseconds. So we can calculate them separately and add them together to get the total delay. Delay is additive. Any questions on this example of transmission and propagation delay? Just note that the reason we can add them together is because while we're transmitting bits, you think they're coming out of the computer, the previous bits are flowing across the link. They're propagating. So the total delay in this case is our 5,000 milliseconds plus 0 0.1 millisecond, which is what we arrived at. So let's return to the slides and we'll see the, the general concepts. So delay is the time it takes to get from one point to another. There's actually different things that contribute to the total delay and we've just seen two of them. We've seen transmission delay, the time to transmit data onto the link, and that depends upon the number of bits to send and the data rate. And propagation delay, the time for the bit or the signal element representing that bit to propagate through the link. And that depends upon the distance of the link, the number of meters, and the speed at which that signal propagates in meters per second. But there may be other things as well. Our transmitter and receiver are computing devices. They don't do things instantaneously, they take some time to process. So sometimes we'll try to count the processing delay. Queuing delay we'll mention later, but we'll, we can visualize that in a different way. Here's our transmitter and, and or source and destination. Let's say the, the person at the source computer presses send. We want to know how long does it take to get that message to the destination computer. Well, it depends on three main factors with a single link. Inside the computer, when they press send, your computer goes to work and does some processing. The application reads the message, maybe puts it into the right format, sends it to your operating system, sends it to your network interface card, your LAN card, a Wi-Fi chip, and that takes time. And those, the delay incurred there, we call processing delay. So the time spent inside the source computer before we actually send anything will classify as processing delay. Then we know that it takes time to get that data out of the computer. Depends upon how many bits we have to send and what data rate we can send at and that's gives, given as transmission delay. So if, if we want to visualize transmission delay, think of it, how long does it take to get the bits out of your computer? out onto the link. 
But once the bits are onto the link, they must flow across the link or propagate, and that takes time, depending upon the distance and the speed. Then they arrive, and at the receiving computer, as each bit arrives, it's processed. Again, the computer takes time to process those bits and passes them up to the end user. The total delay from when I press send until the, the person at the destination computer sees the message is the summation of the four components. Processing at the transmitter, plus transmission, plus propagation, plus the processing at the receiver. So really three, three different types of delay. Transmission, propagation, and processing delay. We would like to be able to predict those things in, in different communication networks. Predict what will the delay be in this particular network. Or understand if we get a particular delay, why is it that value? When we ping another computer and it says the delay is 10 milliseconds, why is it 10 milliseconds? Why not one millisecond, one second? These are the three, three components so far. There's a fourth component that arises primarily when we have multiple links. Here we're focusing on just transmitter, one link, receiver. A fourth component would be if we have two links, we transmit across one link to an intermediate device, and then that transmit across the second link to the destination. The processing or some storage inside that intermediate device will classify sometimes as queuing delay. It must wait in the queue for its turn to be sent. That's another component. But I think we'll return to that uh, through some different examples later. Focus on these three. How do we calculate them? Transmission delay we've done. Here's the equation. Number of bits divided by the data rate. Okay, so we've seen an example of that. Propagation delay. The distance of the link in meters divided by the signal propagation speed. And if I don't tell you, then you can assume the speed is the speed of light. In some questions or an exam, I may say, assume the speed is 2 by 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. But if I don't say, use 3 by 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. Different materials, different media have different speeds, in fact. So we can calculate those two if we know the, the link characteristics. I know my data rate. I know how many bits I want to send. If I know the distance of the link and I have the speed of light, I can calculate transmission and propagation delay. How do I calculate processing delay? How fast is your computer? Well, it depends. There's no one answer. It's not easy to determine how fast it would take someone's phone to process a message and send it versus my laptop versus a su supercomputer. Okay? They'll have different processing delays. So it's hard to calculate processing delay. We don't have a way to do it in this, in this course. Uh, but the good thing is that usually it's quite small compared to the others. Nowadays, computers are quite fast, such that the time spent processing a message in, in RAM by the CPU is very, very small compared to these two components. Transmission delay and or propagation delay will be the major contributors to the total delay. So in, in data communications, often we'll assume the processing delay is so small we can set it to zero. Okay. Compared to the other two, will often assume the processing delay is zero. We have no way to calculate it easily for this course. It depends upon the actual computers being used and what are they doing, what software they're running, whether they're doing something else at the same time. It's very uh, hard to predict that. But the good thing is it's usually very small. Again, unless I tell you, assume it's zero, but sometimes I'll say, let's assume the processing delay is one millisecond in which case you can uh, use that in, in finding an answer. Queuing delay is the time spent waiting in intermediate devices usually. For now, we're going to assume that's small or, or zero. Okay? We'll return to that in later 
topics after the midterm and talk about why do we have queuing delay? How is it different from processing delay? It'll come up when we talk about the internet, queuing delay. Let's focus on the first three. So let's consider some examples. First simple example, just not uh, extend from the well, same approach as the previous one. We have a link from A to B. It's 10 kilometers long. The data rate is 1 megabit per second. And let's assume the speed, as to make it a little bit different, the, the speed of uh, the link, I've looked up the characteristics of optical fiber and other media and some common values are 2.8 by 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. Slightly less than the speed of light. I have a frame of 100 bytes. How long does it take to get from A to B? Do a quick calculation of, of the, the total delay in that case. You can use these equations to calculate the transmission and propagation delay. Link from A to B, the total delay is the sum of the processing plus transmission plus propagation plus processing. In our case, let's assume the processing is zero. I haven't said anything about it. So we only need to find the transmission and propagation delay. So let's do that. First, say the transmission delay. Transmission delay depends upon how many bits we want to send and how fast we can send them. 800, someone said. That sounds correct. But let's calculate it for everyone. It depends upon the data size divided by the data rate. What's the data size? Well, our frame, we have 100 bytes. And the data rate, 1 megabit per second. Here is when it's useful to make sure that you use good prefixes and or be careful with the bits and bytes. Here we have measured in bytes. But here we have megabits per second, so we may multiply by 8 to convert the top one to, to bits. 800 bits divided by 10 to the power of 6, or 1 by 10 to the power of 6 bits per second. Eight hundred by divided by one, we get eight hundred divided by ten to the power of six becomes ten to the power of minus six, which you remember is micro. Okay, so dividing by ten to the power of six, or even simpler one to remember, if you divide by mega, you get micro. So we get eight hundred micro something. Well, what is it? Seconds, because Bits divided by bits per second, the Bs cancel out and we get seconds. S comes to the top. We get 800 by 10 to the power of minus 6, divided by 10 to the power of 6 seconds, or 800 microseconds. So just the full approach for calculating the transmission delay. Do the same, but for the propagation delay, distance divided by the signal speed. Just 
Just remember, propagation is about the physics, the distance in meters, the speed in meters per second. It's not about the, the bits we're sending. We have 10 kilometers divided by our 2.8 by 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. That's a t zero there. Convert to meters, 10,000 meters divided by 2.8 by 10 to the power of 8. And you'll use your calculator. And what do you get? 35.7 something something microseconds. OK, the calculator there will solve that. So the total delay is just the summation of the components. Eight hundred and thirty five what point seven microseconds. So very easy to find the delay of a link. Calculate the transmission and propagation. If also in the question I said the processing delay was four microseconds, then you'd add that on as well. The processing delay is just additive. And I would not, never ask you to calculate processing delay in this course. I would just give it to you. Say the processing delay of each computer is two microseconds. So the total, you'd add on two for the transmitter plus two for the receiver, another four microseconds, if that was the question. Any questions on this simple example? One more to, to make sure it's 100% clear for everyone. Another, another uh, example. We're in Bangkok. We want to send to the US, LA in the US, and we're going to use a satellite. So we have a satellite up in space, and we have a ground station on Bangkok and in LA that we're going to utilize. And they have antennas pointing up to the satellite. So here's our scenario, or our, our network in this case, because we're going to actually have two links. We want to consider we have our office in Bangkok. We have a satellite uh, dish on the roof, and it will transmit up to the satellite in space. And then the satellite is quite simple. And all, all it does is whatever it receives, it then transmits down to the receiving ground station. Let's try and we'll put some numbers to that and then calculate the delay, the total delay from Bangkok to LA. Let's say we have a frame. We want to first calculate for a single frame to send one message of, say, a thousand bytes, one message to LA. How long does it take? It's going to depend upon the distance of each link. In fact, we have two links here. We have an intermediate system. We're going to send the frame up to the satellite. Once that's received, the satellite will send that entire frame down to the receiving station. So I'll give you the, the characteristics. Let's say the links are the same. The distance up to the satellite from Earth and then down from the satellite to Earth is the same. All right, approximately the same, depending, uh, independent of the location. So uh, a common location for satellites, uh, an orbit is the geostationary orbit, which is 36,000 kilometers above Earth. So the satellite is that in an orbit of 36,000 kilometers, such that 
it appears to be all, always over our head as a satellite rotates and as the Earth rotates, it appears fixed above our heads. That's the idea of this orbit. And the link to transmit up is one megabit per second and down is the same. Okay, to make your life easier in calculating, we transmit up and down. And let's say there's a processing delay. The satellites are quite slow. That's four milliseconds, just to add a number in there so we can see it used in the total delay. Uh, you run out of, we ran out of space. Processing delay of, at the satellite only, of four milliseconds. Let's find the response time. So to make, make it simple, assume the link and the uplink to the satellite and the downlink down to Earth again is the same characteristic, same distance, same data rate. Find the response time. Response time is the time to get to LA and get a message back. And let's assume that the message that comes back is the same size as the one we send there. We'll add one more. Uh, no, let's say the, the gateways at Bangkok and LA are so fast that the processing is zero, effectively zero there. Only processing at the satellite. It takes some time there because it's a, a old satellite. Find the response time in this case. Remember the components of delay. We can think every device has potentially some processing delay or some processing delay. It may be zero in, in some cases, but every device has some processing delay. And think from the link's perspective, the link between two devices, there's some delay to transmit onto the link and some delay to propagate across that link. So the simplest way to remember this is that devices have processing delay, links have transmission and propagation delay. Everything's additive, so if you have multiple links and multiple devices, you find the processing delays of all devices you find the propagation and transmission of all links, add them all together. So we'll do that to get the answer for this question. And just to be, to be clear, in, in my example, we transmit one frame up 36,000 kilometers to the satellite. Once that frame is fully received, the satellite spends four milliseconds processing that frame, say looking at the frame, checking the header and so on. Then it sends that one frame down to the gateway in LA. And the distance down is approximately the same as the distance up, 36,000 kilometers. And for this case, we'll say the same data rate as well. The processing delay at the two endpoints is zero. Okay, so we can add that in, but that's easy. And then for response time, when LA receives the frame, it sends back a frame. And for simplicity, let's assume it's the same size, 1,000 bytes. So it will transmit a frame up to the satellite. Satellite will process for four milliseconds and then transmit down. So for the response time, we can think that there are actually four links. Up, Bangkok to satellite, satellite down to LA, and then L LA up to the satellite, the uplink, and the downlink to Bangkok for response time in this case. Four links. Turns out they're the same characteristics. So let's calculate the propagation and transmission delay for the link.
transmission delay, the data size. We transmit a frame of 1,000 bytes divided by the data rate, 1 megabit per second. 8,000 bits divided by 1 gives us 8,000 microseconds. Propagation delay. The distance, 36,000 kilometres, divided by the speed, and here we'll assume the speed of light. Thirty-six thousand divided by three is twelve thousand. Divided by a hundred is one hundred and twenty micro seconds. Times by a thousand is one hundred and twenty thousand. One hundred twenty milliseconds. Be careful. It's kilometers. Okay, thirty-six million meters. Thirty-six million divided by three hundred million. is 0 0.12 or 120 milliseconds. So propagation delay is in milliseconds, transmission delay is in microseconds. Let's convert this one to milliseconds to make our life easier so that when we add them up we're using the same prefix. So let's go back to our picture and make note of those times. The propagation delay to go up is 120. We calculated the propagation delay to go up. The transmission delay on the uplink we calculated to be 8. So it takes 8 to transmit up, 120 to get there. It's such a large distance that the propagation delay is very large compared to prop, uh, transmission. There's also four processing in the satellite. So once the frame gets there, we spend four milliseconds processing. And then the satellite transmits down. And we should calculate the transmission and propagation delay, but the numbers are the same. Same frame size, same data rate, same distance. So it takes another eight to transmit down, plus 120 to propagate. There's no processing at these nodes. So from Bangkok to LA in one direction, zero processing plus eight to transmit plus 120 to propagate plus four to process in the satellite, eight to transmit down, another 120 to propagate down and zero processing in LA gives us a total of 240, 260, 260 milliseconds, these numbers are in milliseconds. How long to get back? It's the same time to get back. Okay, everything's the same in the return path. So the response time, it's 260 milliseconds to get there, 260 milliseconds to get back. Response time is 520 milliseconds. So th for delay, think about the processing delay in devices and think about for links, the propagation and transmission delay. And then separate the network. This is a network in this case where we have two links up or two links to the destination. So we have two links, so treat them separately, calculate the delays and then add them all up. It would be slightly different if we have different data rates on the downlink, for example. And response time is simply to go there and also to send back. About half a second. And this is the, the distance especially is a realistic number. 
geostationary satellites are 36,000 kilometers uh, away from Earth. What's the major contributor to the delay in this case? Well, it's the propagation delay. If I have a higher data rate, let's say I had 10 megabits per second. If the data rate is higher, transmission delay goes down. So the major contributor here is the propagation delay. Processing is small, usually. Propagation is a big problem with satellite communications. So whenever you use a geostationary satellite, if you use it, say, for internet applications, to send a message to the web server and then get a response back, irrespective of where the web server and how fast it's going to be, it's going to take about half a, milli a, half a second to get that response back, which is quite noticeable when you add in other delays of web servers in the internet. So internet access, typical applications via satellite links, the delay is usually a little bit too large to make it usable. It makes it quite inconvenient because the satellite is so far away, the propagation delay we can is the main contributor. How do we reduce the delay? A new satellite closer to Earth. We can't change the speed of light. The satellites at that distance, the only thing we can do to reduce the propagation delay is to bring the satellite closer to the Earth. What's the problem? The Earth rotates and, and if you're close to the Earth, they, the satellites rotate much faster than the Earth rotates. So if you look up, you see the satellite moving and it's no longer there after 10 or 20 minutes. So you no longer have coverage from the satellite. With a geostationary satellite, you look up and it's rotating and you're rotating. So when you look up, it's always above you. You always have coverage. If you have a lower orbit, you need if you just have one satellite, you may only have coverage for one-fifth or uh, one-tenth of the day. The satellite only comes above every so often. So if you want to have lower orbits, you need multiple satellites, a, a network of satellites. One follows the other, and that becomes costly and complex. Let's return to our slides and see what we've missed. In a later lecture, I'll show you the, the well, in a, a later set of slides, we've got the picture of multiple links, but I also have it here to show you. You don't have this in the slides, it may come in a later uh, lecture, but I think from the satellite example you can almost see this already. That is, we've looked so far at a link, but in a network which has multiple links, it's the same concept. We have a source that wants to go to a destination, it doesn't have a direct link, there may be multiple links. So we send to an intermediate device, in our example the satellite was an intermediate device which then sends on to the destination. And we can extend this to have many links, many intermediate systems. You don't have this in your lecture notes, this, this picture. It's OK. You don't need to draw it, because you've already drawn it with a satellite system. But what we saw with a satellite case is that when we have multiple links, When we have multiple links, it just becomes the processing delay in the first device, transmission propagation of the first link, processing delay in the second device, transmission and propagation of the second link, and processing delay in the last device. That's what we had in our satellite example. Except we had zero processing delay here, four here, and zero here and we calculated the propagation and transmission for each link. 
the last thing to mention is that, and we'll not have any examples of it, is that in these intermediate devices, sometimes they need to send data from other people as well, not just your data. The satellite receives a frame from you, but it also has a frame some, from someone else to send. It can only send one at a time, therefore the second one may have to wait. It may wait in a queue and be sent later. And that's why in intermediate devices we'll often see, especially in the internet and large networks, there's an extra delay called the queuing delay, which is the time your frame spends waiting in that device, waiting for others to finish com com being uh, completely sent. So that's where queuing delay will come in when we look at networks in detail. Four components of delay, transmission and propagation we can calculate, processing must be given, and queuing may come up uh, in later topics. The last part here is how do we deal with errors? But instead of starting that, we'll, I think, finish with one, one more example with just the, the five minutes left. One last example. A question about the midterm exam, it will be closed book midterm exam. Last example just to illustrate. And we did this we did this in the previous lecture. We can ping, use an application to test the delay between different devices. When we ping, it's an application that sends from my computer a message to some destination computer, which we denoted here, ICT web server. And when that server receives the message, it sends back a, a short response. And it reports the time. I'll run it again with a smaller window. And the thing of importance is the time here. This is the response time or round trip time. And it keeps repeating this. Every one second, send a message, get a response. Why is the delay in the order of 20 or 30 milliseconds? The average across those uh, 14 messages received was 30 milliseconds. The average delay, it varies, is about 30 milliseconds from my computer to a computer which is on the third floor of this building. Okay, so the question is, why is it 30 milliseconds? Well, we now know. It's a combination of those four different components. From my computer to the computer downstairs, there are multiple links. I'm using Wi-Fi at the moment. So there's a link from my computer to the access point on the wall. That's the first intermediate device. There may be some processing delay there. Then from the access point, there's a cable that goes down. I think it goes directly down to the third floor. That's the second link. Then it goes into another intermediate device and eventually into the server, just a PC on the third floor. So we have at least three links. There may be another one I'm missing. So there are multiple links. Each have their own propagation and transmission delay. In theory, we could calculate them. I know the message size. It's actually 84 bytes. I know the data rate for Wi-Fi. I'm using 54 megabits per second, so I could calculate transmission delay. I could estimate the distance, two and a half meters, divided by the speed of light, and, and estimate the, the link distances and find the propagation delay. 
but also the intermediate devices would have some processing and, and most likely queuing delay, especially the intermediate devices in SIT. Everyone else is doing the same thing when I'm sending. Everyone else is in here sending things from their phone and, and other places via the same network. So some of those intermediate devices would send, receive my frame, but they also receive hundreds of other frames at the same time. So mine have to wait in a queue before it's sent. So that contributes to the queuing delay. And that's hard to measure. We will just observe it in some cases. So now you know why the ping delay, the ping time or response time, well, what contributes to that delay? Processing, propagation, transmission, and queuing delay. And they may vary over time, as we see here. What we'll do on Thursday is finish these slides on just talking about how we deal with errors. And I think that will finish for the, uh, this topic will finish for leading up to the midterm. And we'll say a little bit about the midterm on Thursday, but in short, it will be a closed book exam, bring your calculator, and questions similar to past year's exams and similar to the quizzes. So we'll see you Thursday.